Hi, I'm Giles Martin. I'm here in Abbey Road Studio 2. I was actually born in 1969 um, on John Lennon's birthday, which fascinated him. Um, he said to my dad, no, you're not sort of arsehole he's going to turn out to be. Um, it's funny, growing up as a kid, having a father like George Martin, you can't compare it to anything else. I've never actually swapped dads with anyone. Um, but we didn't necessarily, myself and my sister didn't actually grow up in a in a, in a terribly musical house, apart from, as a kid, I noticed my dad played the piano a lot, and odd people would come back and forth. In fact, when I was a playgroup, my, um, they went around the class, and I was about four or five, and they said, you know, what do your parents do for a living? And they, you know, you know, my dad's an accountant, my dad's a lawyer, my dad's a truck driver, whatever. And I said, my dad just sits at home and plays the piano. And it turns out he was writing, I think he was writing the music for Live and Let Die, the film at the time. And there's huge embarrassment amongst my parents. They go, you know, he's not employed, you know, he's got a proper job. And so it wasn't a sort of thing. I think that, I think growing up in, in, a, in a, it was, I didn't necessarily grow up in a musical household. It wasn't, you know, I had the privilege of meeting people like Paul McCartney at an early age and, and, and meeting, you know, the Beatles at an early age, but they were just friends of my parents. It didn't mean a whole lot to me as a kid. Um, I remember when I became interested in the guitar and became interested in songwriting, Paul did say to me, he was incredibly encouraging, he goes, that's great, you know, I find it difficult to write songs and I'm Paul McCartney. So I did have a privileged sort of background as far as that goes. My parents were always uh, very wary of me getting a proper job. They, I learned to play the guitar, as you can, some people might be able to see quite badly, but behind my parents' back, you know, it was a, it was a thing, you know, don't join the music industry. Um, I'm delighted I did. In fact, I really got involved in music because my dad started to lose his hearing when I was about 16 and he needed a second pair of ears and he didn't really want to tell people he was losing his hearing. So I became his ears to a certain extent. I'd come in and try and help him by through that I would learn off him. And we started working together. And it was actually a great thing because I was needed to a certain extent by him, which is nice as a son and a father working together. And at the same time, he was always very good. He never had a sort of, that's my boy kind of attitude. He was always very uh, receptive to my ideas. And in fact, he's been receptive to people's ideas throughout the whole of his career. And uh, he treated me no differently and was always open to, to my suggestions, however wrong they may be. And you know, God knows I made lots of wrong ones. So it gave me a chance to learn, it gave me a chance to respect him for what he does and what he's done. I, I never thought of, I was never any good um, at learning songs off by heart. I mean, you know, I bluff my way through most things. I've never been terribly accurate at playing anything. I can play a number of things very badly, but I was much more interested in playing for a reason. So as soon as I learned to play the guitar with a friend of mine, we started playing in the underground here, started playing in tube stations and playing whatever songs we could learn, basically, you know, as you do. And my parents were, my dad was especially distraught by this. He didn't want, you know, George Martin's son being arrested because it's illegal. At that stage, it was illegal to busk. In fact, the way we played it should have been illegal, but it was illegal to busk. And uh, I then got into playing bands. I formed a band, you know, as you do. And I had a great time, I think, playing in a band, learning to play an instrument. Learning to play a guitar was the best thing I ever did. And not that I practice the guitar or play it very often now, but it opens so many doors as far as if you're willing to play it to people, if you're willing to bore people with it. It's great, you know, to meet people and chat. It's like a, a great hobby to have. It's better than video games, for instance. And, and I think that being in a band taught me more about recording and music for enough than being the son of George Martin did. Because people, if you're the son of um, someone, people expect you have this knowledge, which generally you don't have. You know, people think you grew up in recording studios. Of course, I'd spent more time in studios than probably people, other people are 16, but it's still just a row of buttons. You know, if you're 16, it's still just, you know, a compressor. Of course, I know what a compressor does. But I hadn't got a clue for a long time because people expect you to know these things. But if you're in a band, you, especially as I was in an unsuccessful band, you have a chance to make a whole lot of mistakes and learn stuff. And the hardest thing, not that it's a bad thing, but the hardest thing if you're a son of some son of some famous or a child of a famous person is you don't get that many chance, chances to make mistakes before people go, people are hoping for the second coming, people are going, he's going to be just like his dad. And if you screw up, you're then the other way. You're then, he couldn't get a proper job. 
And so being in a sort of hidden band gave me a chance to learn. And that's what, you know, music is about evolving. It's about discovering new stuff. It's about learning new songs. It's about learning how things work. It's not about playing the same old things every day. Then things become boring. After playing in a band, I carried on playing in, I always played in, played with people, always like going on tour and playing in pubs and clubs. So I thought, thought, you know, it's just, it was just great fun. And I started writing jingles, I started writing commercials. Um, I started doing gasoline adverts, that was my, for, for France. French gasoline is, was the peak of my life. And that was when I was at university. And then when I left university, I wanted to become a record producer. I wanted to write music people and produce people, but I couldn't, I couldn't, I didn't have any, you know, what do you do? You can't go, I'm the son of George Martin, let me produce you, you know, it's, or, or give me a job. And so I ended up working in press. And at the same time, I started looking at bands. And funny enough, my dad was sort of, he was nervous, I think, of me following in his footsteps at this stage. And I saw a band called My Life Story. They're playing at the, 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 My Life Story, they're playing at the, the Astoria in London. And I went to go see them play and I thought they were good and they were, had a whole lot of strings and I did an arrangement of them and produced them. And they released a single that became sort of number one in Melody Maker and Enemy and the Cool magazines. And someone showed it to my dad and said, look what your son's been up to. And I was just doing it in the evenings, you know, as you do if you're a fan of music and you want to get into music. And that kind of opened doors to me. I left the press job and became a producer. Pro production engineering is, is something that you learn stuff all the time with, like any sort of, sort of music. I mean, I think, for me, starting out and how I am now, if I can work in any form of music, I'm happy. It doesn't matter. It's just, you know, I think um, I produce more stuff now and remix and mix stuff now, probably because in a way it's what people expect of me and maybe I'm okay at it. The Love Project came from, it came from the fact that they needed to do a show. It was uh, George Harrison and Guy Le Liberté, who's the head of Cirque du Soleil, were friends. And they decided to do a show and they decided they couldn't have anyone singing Beatles songs a la Mamma Mia. They didn't want, you know, a chorus singing Hey Jude on stage. And I think that's the right decision. And so they approached my dad and I just had quite a lot of success in the UK doing classical stuff at the time. And Apple came to see me and I sat with my dad and talked to them about it. And I said to them, I could try doing, creating a gig that never happened. And Neil Aspinall, who was the head of Apple, said, you know, I'd love, you know, till we talked about, because he was their roadie, we talked about their shows. We talked about, you know, starting off with Long Tall Sally and finishing with Twist and Shout, or, you know, creating this thing. And I said, well, listen, with Pro Tools and digital stuff, I can perhaps create a gig that never happened. So under complete secrecy, uh, I went upstairs here into a very small room and took some material and I took the beginning, the, sorry, the, the drums from the end and get back because I realized they're the same tempo and because I thought I'd start a gig, never happened with a drum solo going into a song and started moving things around and you know, people said mashing up, I always thought it was a bit rude um, and then thought how am I going to start this and got the piano from a day in the life and turned that backwards because I thought if that makes a good ending it'll make a good beginning as it sucks into the chord from Hard Day's Night. I just had fun, you know, and my view was, you know, if I can impress my dad doing Beatles stuff then that's pretty good, you know, as a son you're always trying to impress your dad I think or, or compete in some way and it just so happened that it was on Beatles stuff and I was auditioning for the Beatles and I really thought that they probably wouldn't like it. You know, I, I really thought that people would think this is a really bad idea. It sounds like a bad idea if you just talk about it. And I then took Within You, Without You and Tomorrow Never Knows and stuck those together because I thought this will definitely get me fired, if nothing else. And they came and they really liked it. They liked the ideas. And so I ended up becoming um, the sort of... <laughs> you know, the sort of legacy which I kind of fought against for a long time, and here I am now in Abbey Road talking about it, um, suddenly became part of it. And uh, I backed up all the catalogue and the Pro Tools and started working on this, on this project, which, which became love. Um, I came with my dog Stan and went to my room and started working, you know, we had a list. I worked with the director of the show and my dad. My dad would come in sort of two days a week and I'd play him ideas and we'd work through stuff. So he was kind of producing me doing it. But the bosses were 
the Beatles, Ringo and Paul, and Olivia, Olivia Harrison and Yoko Ono, who were representing George and John. And it was important that they liked everything. They had to hear everything before it was passed on anywhere, anywhere else. And the interesting thing about the Beatles, it's such a protected circle, rightfully so, that if you do something and no one likes it, no one ever hears it. You know, and that's actually quite a good thing for me because it means I could take risks. You know, occasionally people at Abbey Road were sort of, you know, people who never hadn't heard anything, which the majority of people here didn't like the idea of what we were doing and didn't like the idea of me coming in and changing. People think it's changing history, but it's not because I'm not deleting anything. I wasn't, you know, I, I was just really trying to do something different. And Ringo and Paul would come in. The funny thing is they come and listen to stuff and they're not allowed to take stuff away either. It's not like you give them a CD. The only chance of them listening to the new mixes we were doing was by coming here and listening to them. And then later as we got the technology sorted out and secure drives were done, I would go and see Yoko and sit down with her and work through stuff. And it's fascinating. For me it was fascinating because I have no past with them. You know, I have no, I certainly wasn't there at the time. And so it's kind of on an even, I'm, I'm, I'm way down the pecking order, but it's kind of, I mean, on an even keel, as it were. There's no history, I have no, you know, experience of anything they did. So it was quite easy for me just to go, do you like it or you don't, what, you don't, what don't you like about it? And they were very proactive in it, um, all four of them, you know, the two wives and Ringo and Paul. And, you know, Paul was, Paul was the one that would give me the fear because he's such a good musician. I mean, Ringo is a pretty good musician as well, and they'd, they'd you know, they know their stuff and they know their own material and uh, occasionally in fact when we were doing the show I sat down with Paul I went through each bit and you know played in bits in the theatre and it was great it was a great evening and he goes you know he said to me you know I just I really I, I have to say I really like what you've done and you, what you've done has been sympathetic with my music and I really appreciate that for me that was just you know the best but when, we, when the show, when it came to the opening of the show, at the very beginning when people walk into the theatre and they're sitting down, I couldn't work out what, because they wanted Beatles music to play, and someone said, well, why don't you just do another 60 minutes of, and I mean, it took me two years to do the 90 minutes. So I decided to get as many Beatles on as I could by taking the vocals off, which is difficult with Beatles stuff, because there's so much leakage on the tracks, and just play the backing tracks. So it's like the Beatles are playing, they're backing as you walk in. So you have Dear Prudence with no vocal, you know, you have Should Know Better with no vocal, and Penny Lane with no vocal. And the idea was that it would counterpoint because when because starts, it's just vocals. So I'm sitting with Paul, and he's two, my dad's there, and Paul's there, and Penny Lane's playing in the in the ceiling of the theatre. And Paul goes, and what's this then? And I went, It's Penny Lane. He goes, I know it's bloody Penny Lane, but what is what's it doing in the ceiling? And I said, well, I just thought it would be an idea to, you know, because they listened to everything. I thought it would be an idea to maybe put the backing tracks up there. And he's like, oh, OK, you know, I'll have a listen. And it's right there because it is their music. And, you know, and my dad sometimes, you know, it's, he feels embarrassed because it's, it's not his music and it certainly isn't mine. It is there. It's, they were, there were four Beatles and it was their band and that was it. There's no fifth Beatle. With music, there's things you'd like to do. I, I wish I could play things better, you know. I've always thought, you know, it'd be great to, to really learn how to play the bass properly, or guitar properly, or piano properly, you know. Um, but uh, it's just a question of time. Maybe I'll start watching our video tunes and, and then become a better musician. But, you, you know, there's, I'd like to, you know, work with you know, a really good young band. At the same time, I'd love to go and do something like the Love Project with something else, you know, with taking, taking stuff and creating, make people listen to music again. The good thing about Love is it does, people do analyse and people do listen, and people don't have it on the background, they do actually get into it. And that's why we do music, we do music because we're passionate about it. And so, really, I mean, I, I'm about to write a television thing, I'm, you know, you just, it's a question of writing, producing and being creative and anything that lets you do that, you take. And every day, I just can't believe I, I can do this for a living. You know, I was told by my parents for years it's an impossible job to do for a living, despite coming from my background, because I think maybe when I have kids, I'll be doing the same thing, you know, don't go into music, you know. But it's just, it's, you do it because you love it. And, that's, and, and if you can get paid for it, it means you don't have to do another job to get in the way as well, so it's fantastic. I would say to anyone learning an instrument, anyone you know, struggling, because let's face it, we all struggle with instruments all the time, and we struggle with music. 
is that no matter how hard it is, it's hard for everyone. And that love that you have for it, never let go of it. Because you, know, you might be trying to learn a song and go, I'm never going to learn this. But the fact of it is, you do. You do learn and you do move on. And the thing to do is never ever give up. Never ever lose that drive and that, that feeling you get when you work something out or you hear some great music. Because it's much better than sitting down and watching the telly. I mean, the thing about, the thing about music is that I think if anyone's toured, I used to tour a lot, you know, you end up kind of working on automa automatic pilot. And, uh, and you get, you start amusing yourself with stuff. I was playing bass in a band, and you start playing the same things over and over again. And, and uh, I was once in Germany, and I used to jump off the stage. And, and I jumped off the stage, and I had no idea until I left the theater, how far I was jumping. We played the end of the concert, and I jumped off the stage, and there was no crowd there. I mean, let's face it, it wasn't that popular, but there was, there was a break before the people. And I launched off the stage, and seeing the band's faces, and they looked at me, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to die. I'm going to die in a, in a shit club in Germany. And I dropped about 12 feet. My bass amp almost followed me, because I you know, didn't have wireless or anything. I just, the bass, <laughs> it was like Wile E. Coyote. The, my lead unraveled. <laughs> it's the only thing that kept me alive. And an MPEG SV200 over there called, came, came crashing out afterwards. But yeah, I spent most of my time being laughed at by people. You know, I think it's important. I think it's important in studios to have a good laugh. It's funny, I mean, you know, it's, you know, the Beatles. It's one thing, that, one thing that was shocking for me from listening to all of the tapes, everything they did, was not you know, how serious it was. It was how much kind of fun there is in the tapes, even when you think, oh, the White Album, they didn't get on. They're really cracking up most of the time. And it's kind of, you forget that actually they came to the studio to have a good time. And all the other stuff you read about happened in offices and accountants and all that sort of stuff. Most of the studio stuff is great. And that's the thing about music. Music should be fun. You know, if you're learning music, have a laugh with it. And don't sit on your own and do it. You know, find someone to play with. Because, uh, the great thing about music is there's always someone worse than you. you can, I mean, in my case, you really have to hunt them out. But, you know, there is. And so show off to someone. Well, the, I mean, the great thing about the internet is the fact you can, you can delve into the world of songs and work out chords. And one of the problems I struggle from is you look on the internet, and quite often the, the chord sheets are wrong. There's some guy going, if you know the right way this song goes, please write in. You think, oh, that's no good. I can work that out. And the great thing about iVideo tunes is it breaks down that barrier and you've suddenly been taught by professionals. You've suddenly been taught in a simple way by professionals. It's kind of inspired me. You know, I saw iVideo tunes before, before I got involved in it. And it's inspired me to like going, right, I'm going to see if I can learn the piano better now. You know, and I think that's a great thing. You know, People don't have access to the best people in the world. And now, with iVideo tunes, they do. You can be taught by some of the best people, you know, from home. And the way it's shot and the way it's done is very simple. You know, if I can understand it, it's very simple. So I think it's a great thing. It's a great learning tool for people. And, uh, and I think hopefully it'll, be, it'll create great musicians in the future. I'm Giles Martin. I'm here at Abbey Road to talk about All You Need Is Love. All You Need Is Love was, was, was written with, the, with, the, with the, the idea that it was going to be a, a satellite broadcast. And the, um, they stuck the French National Anthem on the front, which is strange because a lot of people don't actually realize it's the French National Anthem. They just think it's the beginning of a Beatles song, an orchestral piece. Uh, I was asked to use, use it for something the other day. Let's use this building of the Beatles song. It's the French national anthem. You can't just use it willy-nilly. You have the French up in arms. So they recorded it, and they recorded it as a backing track, which is a very modern idea today, because they were going to sing it live on air. This is the idea. And they recorded it down at Olympic Studios on the 26th of June, 19, 1967. And two days before, John and the, and the, and the band decided to, to set up this backing track where they where they, he played the piano. He played, sorry, he played the harpsichord, and my dad played piano, I think, with him. You can hear it on, on tape. 
And fun enough, Paul and George decided to play instruments they never played before. They played double bass, double bass and violin. And it's funny actually because what you hear, and if you listen to listen to the, the, the track very carefully, you hear this kind of tapping sound, this click clack tapping sound, which is actually Paul McCartney banging on his double bass as the song's going on. And it's funny when we came, when we came to doing Love. Um, last year, I played this to my dad, I went, listen to this track, and it really sounds bizarre. And he goes, well, that shouldn't be there. And it's funny, you take it out, because really what it is, in the chorus, it makes sense, in the chorus, he plays the notes on double bass. And George plays one note on a violin. You hear at the beginning of each chorus, this sort of, this sort of slightly out of tune G, bringing in each chorus. And you hear this, and it's funny, it sounds, it's typical Beatles, on its own, it sounds like the wrong thing but put it in the track and it makes complete sense. It adds this kind of swing which all Beatles songs have, this sort of clickety-clack going on the whole time. And it sounds like percussion, but it's actually them banging on, banging on orchestral instruments. So they laid down this track on two tracks. And then on top of that, Ringo just played a straight stare, straight bang, 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 bang. Probably because it's 4-4, four, 3-4, four, four, and he's thinking, what else am I going to do? You can't play fills each time and left that to be, rec to be overdubbed when they sang it live with, with the satellite broadcast. Um, and so they left holes in which then to perform. And so when they came to doing it, doing it live, doing the actual broadcast, John sang live, Paul played bass and sang, George sang and played his guitar solo, which, which happens, and Ringo played full kit in the choruses. So they had this sort of, they played to a guide. And that's how All You Need Is Love was performed. And of course, on the other track was the orchestra. My dad, an orchestral arrangement, demands the Beatles to add in as much as possible. In fact, they, got, they nearly got sued for using In The Mood, which was still in copyright at the end, the Glenn Miller song. They had to uh, settle out of court when the, when, the, when the song came out. And it was the first Beatles song where my dad was given a credit for on a single. It's funny if you think about, you know, producers being in the main now, and in England at the moment we have a number one producer at number one, Timberland's number one. My, my, my dad wasn't actually credited on any single until All You Need Is Love came out. After they did this, this extraordinary sort of live performance where it was all hands to the pump, they were breaking technology, they lost complete um, and utter communication with the, with the truck, the broadcast truck. They were just running wild and they had, you know, a bunch of people, I think the Rolling Stones were in the room, they, you know, they had a huge room full of celebrities, everyone singing along, I think a conga happened at the end on the footage. At the end of this, they then came back and they went, to, they, about a week later they went to Abbey Road and they re-recorded their backing vocals, very quickly, they re-recorded the Love, Love, Loves, just to make them good for the single. And they also, Ringo re recorded his drum roll, so on the live performance, in the very beginning of the song with the French National Anthem stars, there's a drum roll well, there isn't a drum roll on the single there is, but no one ever noticed. No one ever knew it was there. And the song came out. And my, my dad always remembers the song being, um, you know, a big emotional moment because, funny enough, his father had died that week and he was in the studio. And it was almost, he said it was almost the worst week of his life because he really didn't think they were going to pull it off. They really didn't think, I mean, the whole world was watching. It, had, it was the biggest broadcast that had happened ever at that point in time. And uh, he was going through undue emotional stress on top of everything else. Their system went down and it was one of the, a classic studio situation. But I think, I think it, you know, considering if you think about it, it was recorded in maybe three sessions, the whole song, including the orchestra, obviously, which was done live. I think it's a fantastic sounding record. I really do. And, it, and it's, it's a record that, that, that encapsulates it, that generation. It encapsulates the, the whole feeling of all, you know, it, cynics have, have, have written, you know, all in his love and replaced certain words and, you know, and, but really at that time, in 1967, it really did make a difference. This is the tone video for All You Need Is Love. The electric guitar comes in very briefly just to play a short guitar solo. Um, most importantly with this, 
Um, the guitar should be on the bridge pickup just to get a tone that reproduces pretty close to what the original sounds like. Um, you also don't want too much gain on this, so note that on this amp I've got the gain setting about halfway. The treble and mids are boosted just a little bit to have the highs and the mids out in the tone, and then the bass is cranked back some so that I don't get too thick of a tone there since it does have kind of a squawky sound in the original. And that's the tone video for All You Need Is Love. This is the verse segment for All You Need Is Love. I'll play the verse at speed and then slow it down. This first uh, segment starts out with just a regular G major chord. Uh, you can play that a few different ways. You can do the typical one with the third and fourth fingers on the first and second string, or you can do the one with the second and third fingers on the bottom strings and the fourth finger on the third fret of the first string, or you could do the one with the first and second fingers on the bottom string and the third finger on the first string. So it's kind of arbitrary which one you choose. This guitar part is really an arrangement of the harpsichord that's at the beginning of the song. So you can choose whichever guitar fingerings uh, suit for some of these chords. The first two uh, bars are kind of unique in that there's a time signature change. The first bar is 4-4 four, four, and the second bar is 3-4. So you lose a beat in that second bar and those two bars will then repeat. So the first two chords will be a G major to a D over F sharp. That D is just a regular D uh, major fingering. And then you can use the thumb to fret the F sharp, the second fret on the sixth string. So it'll be two beats each. And then the, th the uh, second bar that's in the 3-4 measure will be just a regular E minor chord, and you'll strum that for three beats. So those two bars will repeat. Following that, there's a bass walk down that starts with an A. We'll go A, down to G, down to F sharp, down to E, to D, down to C, and then this figure. So what happens is these chords are arranged so that the bass note ends up being that descending figure. So the first chord will be a D7 and then with an A on the bottom, so that'll be an open fifth string. So the D7 is the first finger on the first fret of the second string, the second finger on the second fret of the third string, and the third finger on the second fret of the first string. And then strum five strings to do that. Going to a G, then D over F sharp, to an E minor, to a D major, and then a D over C. To do that, I would keep the first and second fingers where they are, take the fourth finger and put it on the third fret second string, and take the third finger and put it on the third fret fifth string. And then we'll have a bass walk up that goes B, C, D, D, E. So it'll be the second fret on the fifth string, to the third fret on the fifth string, going to the open fourth string, and then open fourth string to the second fret on the fourth string. So I'll play the verse at half speed. And that's the verse.
This is the chorus segment for All You Need Is Love. I'll play the chorus at speed and then slow it down. This chorus is entirely in 4-4 except for the last measure which is in 2-4. In the verse, we had several bars of 3-4 where we played an E minor chord and the other at the end of the verse where we had the figure going into the chorus. So we don't really have any of those odd times in the chorus except where we lose two beats at the end. Um, the chorus starts out with a repeated figure of two measures, starting with a G major chord, going to an A7. The A7 looks like an A with a hole in the middle got the second finger on the second fret of the fourth string and the third finger on the second fret of the second string. So that'll be two beats each, then a measure of D7. And that two bar uh, section there will repeat, and so the D7 will ring for a whole measure. Following that will be another measure with two beats of G, going to a B7 chord. So this starts with the first finger on the first fret of the fourth string, the second finger on the second fret of the fifth string, the third finger on the second fret of the third string, and the fourth finger on the second fret of the first string. I'm going to strum five strings, then two beats of E minor, then going to a G over D chord. You can do this by barring two strings on the first and second on the third fret with your first finger. Use the second finger to play the fourth fret third string. The third finger plays the fifth fret fifth string and the fourth finger plays the fifth fret on the fourth string. And I kind of do a syncopated feel here. So you hit that on the offbeat. The next chord is a C major 7. That's played by taking a regular C major and removing the first finger so that you have the open uh, second string ringing as the major 7. Going to a D7 and then ending on the 2-4 bar of G major. So I'll play the chorus at half speed. And that's the chorus. This is the guitar solo for All You Need Is Love. I'll play the solo at speed and then slow it down. This guitar solo starts in the 7th position. The first finger will hit the 7th fret on the 3rd string. That's kind of a pickup note, so that'll be the last 8th note of the previous measure. Then on beat 1, take the 3rd finger, and you'll stretch it over just a little bit, and using the 2nd finger to help, bend the 10th fret on the 2nd string up a whole step. And so you'll hold that for a half note, two beats, and on sort of the last eighth note of that, you'll let the bend fall off. And then move your hand down two frets so that your third finger is now on the eighth fret and bend a whole step once again. And once again, fall off of that. Then we'll do one more whole step bend. This is just a quick bend and release. Now the next note is going to be an E. Now this is in the 3-4 uh, bar, so this will be over the E minor chord. We're going to hit an E note. Um, there's an E note here on the ninth fret, third string, 
or the fifth fret, the second string. So you could really hit either. This note does have pretty wide vibrato on it, so it may be easier for you to hit that with the first finger on the fifth fret, second string, but really you could hit it on the third as well. Then on the second eighth note of the following measure, you'll be back on the seventh fret, third string, and doing a very similar lick. So we'll hit the seventh fret, third string again, and then bend the tenth fret up a whole step once again. And after that, slide down and bend the eighth fret once again. And then another bend and release of the eighth fret. And then land on either the nine or the fifth fret. And then we've got one more eighth note in the following measure that's on the and of one. So that'll look like this. So I'll play the solo at half speed. And that's the guitar solo for All You Need Is Love. This is the outro segment for All You Need Is Love. On the outro, we've only got one chord that sustains as the song fades out. And it's going to be a G major. Once again, you could finger it several different ways. Uh, we've got three most common being this with the third and fourth finger, just the third finger, or just the second, third, and fourth fingers. And so that chord is just going to be comped through the ending of the song. And you just strum it uh, as quarter notes for three beats and then do an eighth note on beat four. That's the outro section. This is the performance of All You Need Is Love by The Beatles.
Oh, yeah.